Hello all. I'm uh, coming back to you now with a, uh, a new air gun review. This time I'm going to do the Air Arms TX200. Uh, my mission with this review is going to be uh, to tell you about things, uh, of, about parts of ownership of the rifle that you can't tell from, uh, from looking at the ad copy or uh, promotional videos. Uh, or the specifications and things like that. I want to, to give you the idea of what it's like to own this rifle uh, with all the pros and cons. Uh, I'm unsponsored. I bought the rifle myself. and um, So you'll get that 100% uh, you know, unbiased perspective. Um, here's the gun. Air Arms TX200. I'm sure you've already seen a lot about how great the fit and finish is. Uh, I agree with that. It's awesome. Um, the bluing is, uh, is just as deep and beautiful as they describe and now that I think about it I'm not even sure it's technically considered bluing. Um, it's so perfect that I think it, it might be some kind of a black chrome or something. Uh, I haven't polished this either. This is just how it is. It's still got my fingerprints all over it and everything. That's just how it is. See how it's a, kind of a mirror like finish? I'm not sure if it's, if it's actually bluing at that point anymore. Um, uh, the fit and finish are, just as you've probably read elsewhere, excellent. Uh, they have the, uh, the stocks done by someone else uh, uh, out of Italy. You can see it's got that famous fish scale checkering. If you get the, uh, the Pro Sport, you kind of give that up uh, in favor of something no less fancy. But, uh, so the fit and finish you know, lives up to the expectations that have been set for it. It's just excellent. That's probably a good one or two hundred dollars worth of the uh, the price of the gun. Uh, the weight of the rifle, how does it feel in the hands? Uh, this is something I didn't read a lot about before I bought it. Um, I saw one or two comments that it was heavy but nobody complained about it uh, and I really wasn't prepared for how heavy it is. It's almost as heavy as my Diana 56 TH uh, which is to say very heavy. Um, I can only shoot maybe two or three shots offhand, and then uh, my back starts to hurt and my muscles start to uh, get tired. So if you plan to shoot it offhand a lot, uh, you either better be prepared to, uh, to get used to the weight, to build up those muscles that you need, or uh, only take a couple shots at a time before you have to rest for a little while. Um, it's just not a great offhand shooting rifle. Um, it's pretty heavy, uh, the, the action is pretty heavy. The under lever is solid steel. So that makes it not only heavy, but it's uh, heavy towards the barrel. So uh, some folks like that because it tends to stabilize it a little bit uh, when, you're, when you're target shooting. Um, but that uh, kind of inherent to that, that means it's better off the bench and uh, from any kind of rest than it is just pure offhand. Uh, for example, if I shoot it you know, from a, a field target position like this and I rest it there, that's no problem. Or you know, I rest it like this on my hand, or I, I take a rest on a tree or something. Uh, none of that's any problem. Or shooting prone or whatever, it's all fine. But uh, when you start to shoot offhand, especially standing offhand, uh, then it starts to feel uh, pretty heavy. So that's something you should be prepared for. What's the shooting experience like uh, in stock form? A lot of people modify these, but uh, I want to tell you what it's like in stock form. Um, I'm sad to say, I'm sure someone's going to really jump down my back about this, but in stock form, it was not a great shooting experience. Uh, it's, it, shoot, it shot at about 16 foot-pounds, uh, and mine's at 177, and uh, kind of hard to cock. Uh, not quite as hard to cock as a, man, uh, a Magnum Springer, but uh, kind of hard to cock, too. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't shoot it all day without some uh, back pain. Um, but 16 foot-pounds, to be honest, that's more than it needs to be. I think it was designed originally for uh, 12 foot-pounds uh, from the British market. That's kind of their limit over there. Uh, and also, it's, it's kind of buzzy and twangy. I read before I bought this that it's, uh, it's almost like a tuned rifle out of the box. And uh, maybe from the perspective of accuracy, that's true. But as far as the smoothness of the shot cycle, it's not true at all. It's very buzzy and twangy. Um, I gave it to a couple of uh, club members, and uh, the one said, Ooh, that's a twanger. And uh, yeah, I didn't even think about it. I figured as long as it's accurate, who cares? 
Uh, you know I'm the only one that can hear the spring buzzing around in there, but then I noticed uh, the stock screws kept loosening themselves up. You got an Allen screw in each side here, and then a big Allen screw here, and another one here, and three out of the four of those were loosening up uh, kind of routinely. Um, the first, I don't know, 100 shots or so, I guess I shouldn't judge too much, uh, it came loose. I, uh, I put some Loctite on, some blue Loctite, and retightened them, and then shot some more. Um, I, now, to be honest, I didn't wait the full 24 hours that you're supposed to wait for the Loctite to dry. But I tightened them up properly, and they shot loose again. Uh, and I was finding, you know, vertical stringing. And so, it was actually kind of like diagonal stringing. So I figured it out that that was the problem. And uh, I can show you why here. This is the original spring. Uh, I should say it's the original spring assembly. So we have the spring uh, well oiled. The ends of it are properly finished. They're ground flat. Um, no complaints there. In the spring you have uh, this part of the assembly. I guess that this part is in the middle is called the spring guide. And then there's a, a steel washer that goes underneath the spring guide. And then on the other end we have this little guy which is also steel. That goes in here, and then uh, it drives the piston, which has this uh, the piston seal. And you'll notice in this whole assembly here, it's steel from one end to the other. The only thing that they have to dampen the vibration is this, uh, this rubber piston seal. Uh, so eventually what I did was I replaced this with the, uh, the Vortec 12 foot-pound uh, PG2 kit. Um, so it cocks easier. It's easy enough that you could shoot it all day again. And it also, the Vortec kit has a plastic sleeve on this end. Uh, and then it has, this part is a hard rubber. Forgive me, I forgot what that part is called. And it also came with a hard rubber uh, piston seal. And then there's, there was also an O-ring that, uh, that goes behind the piston seal. Uh, so you have more points to dampen the vibration. You have a uh, a hard rubber part here. Um, this part is hard rubber and then also the o-ring that goes underneath the piston steel seal to dampen the vibration even more. And uh, that seventy or eighty dollar kit really made the shooting experience better. Uh, it cocks easier. Um, it's just as accurate. I won't say more accurate, but it's just as accurate. Uh, and it's it's smooth. It's not buzzy or twangy at all. So I highly recommend that kit. That was the, uh, uh, I think that was is closer to the way that it was originally uh, designed and intended to be shot. Um, let's see. Uh, also, in addition to that, to being too heavy to shoot offhand too much, it's pretty heavy to carry around. So if you're thinking about this for like a field hunting rifle, you want to consider that uh, as well. Uh, you would definitely want to have some kind of a sling on it. Um, but you can see from looking under the forearm here, it's open from up here all the way down there, uh, at least half the length of the, of the stock. So you can't put a sling swivel stud here. Uh, you, could put, you could put the other one down here. Uh, you would Probably your best bet would be to get a shotgun sling, uh, one that just uh, tightens with a loop here, and then the other one uh, between the, uh, the barrel and the cocking lever. That would make it uh, bearable to carry all day, but as you see it here, this is a Hawk uh, 6-24 to 24 by 44 uh, Vantage scope, and the rifle, it's, uh, it's over 12 pounds and it would get heavy. Uh, so as a hunting rifle, I don't know, the accuracy makes it great, um, but you definitely want to have a sling uh, to carry it. Uh, the next thing, uh, although it is buzzy and twangy right out of the box, uh, it's very easy to work on. Uh, if you search YouTube, you can see some videos on that. And um, it's just as easy as they make it look. There's, uh, there's one British guy, and I forget his name, but he seems to own an air gun shop, and he shows a, a drop-in tuning kit, and he takes it apart. This guy is an expert. He's obviously done this a few times. Uh, when I did it, uh, when I put in the Vortec kit, it didn't go quite that fast for me, but it was the first air gun I'd ever taken apart. And uh, it was... I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 minutes max, uh, no problems at all. Um, 
And I also just put a Vortec kit in my Vyroch HW30S and it was much harder in the uh, in the Vyroch. So this is a very, very easy gun to work on. So if you're willing to spend an extra 70 bucks uh, for, the, for a tuning kit, either the full power or the 12 foot pound tuning kit, uh, it's easy to make it better yourself. So that's kind of a nice part about it. And when I took it apart, I didn't have to do I didn't have to grind down any burrs or polish anything. Every The fit and finish inside was already pretty uh, impeccable. Uh, this one has the beech stock. It's also available in walnut. Uh, for the extra 100 or 120 bucks, the, the walnut stock is a little bit lighter. Uh, it has a more striking grain pattern. Uh, but the beech, um, it's just got kind of a plain grain. Uh, it's a little heavier. Uh, but you know it saves a hundred bucks and the rifle uh, if you're like me It's already stretching your budget a little bit to buy the rifle. So um, uh, There you have it. I'll give you a kind of a close-up of my stock You can see it's got some grain to it. It's nothing that's uh, you know uh, Earth-shatteringly beautiful, but uh, it's it's nice to look at you can also notice here that where you use it It's kind of a matte finish you can see over here kind of matte over here it's shiny because that's where I, I hold it a lot, but it's a good looking uh, wood, just kind of plain. It's not flashy like walnut. Walnut will save you a few ounces in weight though. Uh, let's see. The safety. One thing I noticed is that uh, after, I don't know, the first couple of hundred rounds, the, the safety function was kind of intermittent. And I remember reading in the manual that you're supposed to put a drop of oil in the safety uh, every time you shoot it, uh, preferably before you shoot it rather than after, and uh, it keeps the safety working right. But after a couple hundred rounds, the safety on this one, uh, it only worked maybe 15% of the time. So if that's something that really concerns you, like uh, if you've got bad gun handling habits, then um, uh, maybe avoid this gun or plan on using oil. Uh, but it's also worth mentioning that once I put in the 12 foot pound kit, that problem completely went away, even if I don't oil it. You know, the safety works fine then. That's another thing that makes me think it really was designed with uh, 12 foot pounds in mind. Uh, compared to the Pro Sport, uh, I don't have a Pro Sport, I've never shot one, but uh, uh, reading some comments from people who have, obviously it's less expensive by a couple hundred dollars. Um, the TX200 is less hold sensitive. Uh, because of the extra weight. So the same thing that makes the Pro Sport more balanced and better to shoot off hand also makes it worse to shoot off of a rest or um, you know if you're not an expert springer shooter and you, you tend to shift uh, you know your grip tightness and your shoulder tightness and move this hand around then um, that kind of uh, it's another it's kind of another endearing feature of the TX is that you don't have to be a, a springer expert, so to speak, to shoot it well. Um, the, another thing is the anti-bear trap mechanism. You can see the, uh, the button here. When you cock the rifle, you hear chick, 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 chick. That's the anti-bear trap mechanism. And it's kind of a safety thing uh, to protect the people who have uh, bad uh, air gun habits and they cock it and they leave the lever, lever hanging and then they stick their thumbs in here to load it. Uh, if that internal latching mechanism were to let go, um, the sliding breech would cut off the end of your thumb. So that's kind of a safety feature. You can't get that cocking lever up until you push this. So I'm going to decock it now, which you pull the lever all the way down, take the safety off, pull the trigger, uh, and it's actually kind of hard to do because because of the anti-bear trap mechanism. So never mind, maybe I won't decock it. Uh, compared to a less expensive Springer, you might be thinking, well this is, uh, Jeremy you're talking about $700 here, what does it get me over $150 Crossman or something like that? And it just so happens that uh, I have a less expensive Springer, and it's actually a good quality one. It's a Stoger X20. Um, and one of the things about this is that the, the cheaper Springers by the big companies, uh, usually they have pretty crappy stock triggers. Um, and this one was no, no exception. 
It was a long first stage, and the second stage, you had no idea where it was going to break. It was kind of heavy, kind of gritty, you didn't know where it was going to break. So I upgraded the trigger, but otherwise this is stock. So this is about $150, $180 gun, and uh, I replaced the stock trigger with a Charlie Datuna trigger. And uh, now it's still kind of a heavy pull, but it breaks predictably and cleanly. So taking even taking out the bad trigger, we can compare them side by side. This is a lot lighter. Um, it's better to shoot offhand, so um, that's something to consider. But I'll shoot them side by side here in a couple of minutes for you. We'll see uh, in my basement range here, we'll see uh, if there's any discernible difference at 14 yards. And uh, let's see, I showed you the spring assembly. Uh, scope choice. Uh, now that's, that's going to depend on what you want to do with it. Uh, like I said here, I wanted to try and get the most accuracy out of it. Uh, this is kind of a heavy scope. It's, it's only the one inch tube version, but 6 to 24 by 44, it's kind of a big objective. Uh, and then I got the one piece mount because it was almost a magnum level springer. Uh, when I got it, it was shooting at 16 foot pounds. Um, so there's that. Uh, if you want a lighter weight option, the Burris uh, Timberline, four and a half to 14 by 33. It's either 32 or 33, I don't remember which. This is an awesome scope. It costs the same as this Hawk, right around $200. Um, the optics, I think, are a little bit clearer. They're a little bit better color corrected. Um, it's not quite as bright with only a 33 millimeter objective lens instead of a 44. Uh, but if you want to try and keep it as light as possible and still have a decent amount of magnification, I highly recommend this scope. Uh, adjustable objective on both of them. Uh, if you wanted to do hunting, you know, probably something in the uh, in the 9 to 12x range on the max is, is going to be fine. If you want to do field target or uh, paper punching, then you probably want something a little bit more than that because the gun is accurate enough to uh, shoot beyond the resolution of like a, a fixed 4x scope or something like that. So, the pros, it's accurate and it's beautiful. Uh, some people, that's enough to sell it right there. Um, and it's easy to work on. The cons are is are that it's expensive, um, it's heavy, especially toward the barrel, and uh, it's kind of buzzy and twangy uh, as it comes out of the box uh, for the U.S. market. Um, the British and the the Euro market ones may be better, uh, but if they don't have some more vibration isolation in there, they're still going to be kind of buzzy, even if the uh, even if the cocking effort is lower and so forth. So with that, let's do a, uh, a comparison shot. I've got a couple of targets set up down there at, uh, at 14 yards. I'm going to take five shots with the TX200 and then five shots with the Stoger X20. Uh, the testing and the manual for the, uh, for the TX says that uh, it was tested and it was, uh, uh, we assure you that the performance is good with air arms pellets. We don't guarantee performance with any other pellets. I thought, you know, what a bunch of hoo-ha. Of course they're going to try and pitch their own pellets. And, and we all know they're made in the JSB factory, but with the Air Arms molds. So I had some on hand. I tried them. I tried a whole bunch of pellets. But sure enough, the best shooting ones for me have been the Air Arms Diablo Field, 8.4 grain, uh, 4.51 millimeter head diameter. I tried the 4.52s also. They didn't shoot as well. And they didn't really seem to be diameter controlled. Uh, as you would think that they might be by the spec. Uh, sometimes the 4.52s fit looser than the 4.51s. So, uh, Crossman Premier Light also worked well. JSB Exact also worked well. Uh, out of the box, JSB Exact Heavy were actually the most accurate. Um, and somebody, well, tied with the Diablo field, somebody talked me out of not shooting the heavy pellets uh, for fear that it might uh, lessen the spring life. So, with that, I'm going to scooch back here a couple of steps. I'll show you uh, a couple of shots uh, with the camera pointing me. You can see what the cocking is like and what the shooting cycle is like and the recoil and so forth. And then I'll move the camera back and I'll zoom in on the target for, uh, for, the, next, for the last couple of shots. So I'm going to shoot just sitting on, the, on my basement floor here. Air Arms Diablo Field pellets. Or five. Okay. Uh, the best way to cock and load this is to cock with your left hand and load the pellet with your right hand. Um, 
And the reason is the loading port is closed on the right side. You can see here, didn't mean to flip you off there, sorry. I got a pellet in my other hand. The loading port is here, but on the other side. So if you try to load the pellet in with your left hand, you're kind of reaching around in an awkward way. So what I like to do is I put it uh, on the floor or on the bench or on my leg uh, and then break loose the cocking lever. There's a, a sprung ball detent here that holds in place. You break that loose and then oh, it's already cocked from before. Keeping the hand on there just in case uh, the internal latching and the anti-bear trap fail. Just load the pellet in the breech like that push the button and uh, close that up. And then uh, I also forgot to talk about in stock form there's a little bumper that goes between the uh, the barrel and the, the cocking lever. Uh, that's not a very good design. It falls off within 10 shots. It doesn't really want to go back in. So if you if you squeeze these together then the cocking lever will hit the bottom of the barrel and eventually nick up the bluing. But once you discover uh, through experience how much uh, power it takes to latch it close, you don't overshoot it like that. And a lot of guys have mentioned that uh, if you find the right size O-rings and you put them in these little grooves here, that's even better anyway. So, cock loaded, ready to do, ready to go. Safety I already took off. Take aim here. Uh, set my scope to 16. And focus for 15 yards. Take my first shot on here. These may not be indicative of what the rifle can do, but I'll try my best, all right? I might speed up the video later, too. Okay. this. Uh, just for reference, I'm 5'8", 170 pounds, so if you're about that same weight, then my cocking effort will be uh, representative for you. So there's three shots. Let me pull the, uh, the camera and the tripod over here and uh, zoom in on my target for you down there. And this uh, upper left target is the one I'm shooting at with the TX. There's maximum zoom. Okay. Loading up my fourth pellet here. All right, so there you have it. There's a, uh, a five-shot group. That's a typical uh, group from the field target shooting position, at least for me. Not too rushed, not too serious. So now, let's try it with the Stoger X20. Put these pellets away. The Stoger X20, at least mine, seems to prefer 
uh, Crossman Premier lights. Got a tin of those here. This one's got a leaker, a leapers four to sixteen by forty. Uh, adjustable objective. It's been a very solid scope so far, and it's got a lit reticle, which is pretty nice uh, for field target shooting. The cocking effort on this at about 15 foot-pounds is less than the stock cocking effort on the uh, on the TX. Uh, maybe there's more leverage because the, the cocking arm is the barrel and it's a little bit longer, but uh, So this time I'll shoot at the bottom right target, uh, which doesn't matter much to you, but uh, see what I get here. You can hear it honks. <laughs> and that's the spring because when, it's, when the spring's already cocked it doesn't make that honking sound, but doesn't seem to affect accuracy, but it's a sign that the spring is rubbing the inside of the uh, of the cylinder. Uh, this feels it feels better resting on the uh, on the forward arm too because it's lighter. Uh, the TX will actually, if I shoot it long enough, it'll make my arm start to go to sleep. Actually shaping up to be a decent group too. Looks like about the same size. All right, and I'll pull you back over here, and we'll zoom in on the target again to see how the rest of it goes. So that's uh, three shots, I believe. You hear that honk? <laughs> uh, this one, by the way, never had any problems with shooting loose either. I don't know if you can tell from the uh, the video. It tends to uh, the microphone on the video cameras tend to attenuate uh, noise that gets kind of loud. But uh, this one shoots about twice as loud as the uh, TX. Uh, the TX for the last few inches of the barrel has some baffles in there to help keep it quiet. This one doesn't. This is the pre-suppressor version of the X20. All right, so I'll zoom out a little bit so we can see both targets. And you might be able to tell already the TX group is tighter. Um, this is only 14 yards, but uh, the result of that, uh, the Stoger group is on the bottom, uh, the TX group is on the top. At 14 yards, they look like they're pretty similar, and if you were uh, pesting or small game hunting at you know 15 yards or maybe even 20 yards, uh, it might not be worth it uh, from the accuracy perspective uh, to upgrade to the TX uh, over something cheaper. But I'll tell you what, when you get out to 40 yards, uh, it's a much more dramatic difference. So, uh, there you have it. Uh, take, a, take a look at the video description below for some comments. Maybe I forgot to put something in, I'll slip in there. And uh, also check out the comments below. And uh, if you like the, the video, then uh, please click like. And uh, consider subscribing if you like uh, air rifle uh, reviews and Swiss Army knife reviews and things like that. So, 
Thanks for joining me, and uh, I'll see you soon on another review. I'm going to do an update on my uh, Virau HW30S and of the Diana 56TH pretty soon. See you next time. Bye.